Welcome everybody. So give people a minute here to join. So appreciate everyone joining us here today for uh, continuing the threat education series. Um, today we're going to be talking about how to prepare for the next major breach. You know, it's a matter of uh, you know when, not if. And uh, we do have uh, two speakers here with us. Um, have Chris Lafour, who is a, a senior incident response engineer. He also heads up uh, our incident response team. Uh, and then we also have uh, Tim Miller, who is one of our uh, product operations managers over XDR. So we give people a minute here, and then I'm not sure if Chris or Tim is going to be the first uh, up the bat, but I'll hand it over to them here shortly. That'll be me. That'll be you? Okay. So whenever you're ready, Tim, it's all you. And I let me uh, also encourage people to, uh, uh, you know, Please try to make this interactive. We do have people that are monitoring the chat and the Q&A. So feel free to let us know you're there. If you have any questions or anything like that, you know, feel free to uh, you know, put them in the Q&A or within the chat itself. And, and we'll try to get to as many of those live as, as we possibly can. So thanks everybody for uh, joining and I will hand it over to Tim. Great, thanks Eric. Yeah, and preferably uh, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. It, it can become kind of cumbersome to uh, find them in chat later if, if people start coming in rapid fire. So. Give me a quick second here, and actually, I need to re. Oh, there it is. Okay. All right. You guys should be seeing my screen now. Yep. Yep. We can see it. You're good. Excellent. So um, today we're going to go over um, recent breach, um, breach, and uh, uh, recent events that have happened. Um, and kind of give you a little bit of an idea of how you can use um, security practices and other items to help identify the breach before it becomes uh, an all-out event in your environment. So uh, as I begin, I, my agenda today is uh, what's happened recently, what's happening now, um, and the things things happen and vulnerabilities exist. How do you identify these vulnerabilities with a Q&A um, with uh, Chris and myself? So that's kind of the quickness of it. I've only got 10 slides. One of them is a thank you slide. So we'll be pretty quick here. So in recent uh, news, we've seen uh, an, an attack that's happening on Fortinet. So a little bit of history on this, and I've got a slide that goes over all the patch details, but there was a CVE, a vulnerability identified in Fortinet uh, VPNs um, back in 2018 that was patched in 2019. Uh, but during that time, uh, attackers, hackers, whatever you want to call them. I don't like using the term hacker because that is given a negative condensy and it's not really what it is, but um, attackers came into these firewalls and VPNs, pulled out uh, user IDs and login information and sold them on the dark web. Um, well, recently those passwords and IPs were leaked to the public web via GitHub site. Um, and there's a link here for the bleeping computer uh, news article that goes into a little bit more detail on this. Uh, and basically what's happening is uh, people may have already patched this vulnerability and we hope that they have, but if they haven't updated and changed user login credentials and passwords, um, the attackers can still get through without being halted at all because they've already got the identification to come through, right? They've already can be authenticated. So a little bit about the, the history of the CVE. It was first identified in 2018. Uh, it was properly disclosed to Fortinet, so they had the opportunity to build a patch. Patch was released in uh, 2019. Um, and there's an article here on uh, Fortinet's website that talks about all the different patches that have come out since. There's been more than one, but the initial patch came out in 2019. Uh, and then the CVE was published publicly on uh, June 4th, 2019. So, uh, a couple of weeks after the patch was released, they uh, they did release that publicly. IPs and credentials, again, were uh, on sale shortly after uh, identification of the CVE um, was published and uh, attackers were able to get through. Uh, there's a lot of uh, organizations take time to update their products, whether it's software or hardware based, and that leaves them open and susceptible to the attack, right? Um, the IPs and user account information was leaked on uh, September 15th of this year uh, publicly to the web. Uh, anybody can access it. 
Uh, and in fact, um, here's an example of some of the data I've redacted any identifying uh, information here, but basically this was IP addresses, uh, domain names and user IDs and login credentials, again, publicly available on this GitHub site. So um, Trend has gone out and reached out to customers that we found that have matching IPs um, that may be susceptible to this to help uh, mitigate and resolve that. Um, but it may be a good idea for you to go out and investigate and see if there is. And you can see here just on this GitHub site, 19,267 unique IPs uh, identified. Okay. So let's see what, what's happening now, right? So we talk about the CVU as a, uh, the, the vulnerability was identified, a CVU was assigned to it. Um, but what's happening today, right? People have patched. All right. So they're, they've got connections coming in. Um, through VPN via the web, through their firewall, connect to the local network, and then going off to endpoints and servers, um, wherever they need to go, right? So an attacker comes in and he has this publicly available information, <clears throat> login credentials. Um, he hops right through the web, goes to the firewall because he authenticates, gets on the network, and then tries to do some reconnaissance and traverse the network and move, do some lateral movement, see what all he can do within the environment, right? So he's dropping evil along the way. Um, so maybe you identify that there's a problem. So you put a geo block on, right? You're seeing a lot of people coming in from other countries, other regions that don't typically come in. You put that geo block on. Well, it's really easy for our attackers to get around a geo block uh, simply by using a VPN, right? So you don't like me coming in from uh, China or Russia, I'm going to come in through US via VPN. So there's really not a way to stop them via geo block, right? So we need to find a way uh, how we can identify them, how we can identify the attack, knowing that they've got the credentials and there's nothing blocking them. Um, how are we going to identify this, right? So Trend's answer to this is to put in uh, trend products, obviously. So on the endpoint, Apex One, on the server or cloud workloads, uh, cloud one workload security, uh, and put in a network IDS. In, in Trend's case, that's a deep discovery inspector. Uh, and that all feeds into our, our XDR platform known as Trend Micro Vision One. So uh, the, uh, the way we can help identify this as it's coming in, right? So the attacker comes in, he's going across, Maybe he, he's done, uh, he's dropping malware, he's dropping ransomware, uh, he's trying to do privilege escalation, that sort of thing can all be identified at the endpoint. Um, but maybe he's not trying to do anything malicious just yet, he's just trying to traverse the network and see what else he can find. Well, that's where the DDI comes in um, because again, this person's authenticated, it doesn't look like he's evil, he can get to a server, he can start mapping out the network, doing the, the information gathering, moving laterally throughout. And that's where the DDI comes in because that gives you the visibility of north, south, and east and west, uh, and along with whatever uh, payloads they're pushing, what protocols and ports they're using, so you can really get an idea of what's happening. So without this network IDS, there's a bit of a blind spot, right? Because all of this is authenticated uh, until they do something that is recognized as, as bad, evil, right? Well, all this data feeds down into the data lake for the customer and is displayed within the console of Trend Microvision 1, right? So we can pull in through um, email, we can pull in through endpoint sensors in, again, Apex 1 and Cloud 1 Workload Security, um, through network, through DDI. Uh, and we also have other um, connections coming in for, through third-party entities, so firewalls and that sort of thing. So how does this really help? By bringing all of these in together, right, they're natively in, in the environment, we can reduce the time to identify the threat. Um, we can reduce their dwell time and their ability to gather more information and do more bad. Uh, and we can quickly resolve this and mitigate it before it turns into an all out um, assault on the company, right? So again, all, we're blind to the coming through the network through the firewall, but once it hits the network and the endpoints, we can start to see what's going on in this specific case. Uh, so what can customers do to, uh, to prepare? Uh, first and foremost, patch. Uh, I know it's, it's kind of a bad word in some areas, 
uh, because sometimes when you patch things, other things can break and it becomes a nightmare and you like to do your testing and that sort of thing ahead of time. If you can't patch right away, um, Trend has some products uh, that will help you do a virtual patch. Uh, it's not a patch management tool, but will allow you to uh, put a virtual patch in place that would block any of this network-based communications through IPS via a uh, tipping point or through Cloud One and Apex One through a host-based IPS. Uh, implement secure uh, password practices and management. So you want to be able to uh, make sure that the passwords are being updated regularly, uh, that they are using secure passwords. Multi-factor authentication is, would be amazing here. A lot of companies still not doing that. Um, great practice. Uh, your, your users will get used to it. It'll just become second knowledge. They'll get their multi-factor ready when they know they're going to log in. So all the pushbacks, it's, it's worth it. It needs to be done. Hire a 24 uh, by seven security monitoring, uh, whether that be through a third party SOC as a service or your own internal team. Uh, you need somebody watching for these indicators. If you're sitting in front of a SIM uh, or you're just sitting in front of a, a council for your management on your endpoint protection, you need somebody who can identify these markers or these differences, these variances that are happening uh, to help you identify quickly and, and mitigate quickly. Um, Trend recommends to deploy multi-layered uh, endpoint protection like Apex One or Cloud One Workload Security. Um, we don't rely on just machine learning. Uh, we have behavioral analysis in there. We have still have signatures because a lot of stuff comes in and is easily identifiable through file reputa reputa reputation, excuse me, uh, web reputation, right? So we can identify if there's command and control servers or known bad URLs, um, uh, the IPS that's built in as well. All these things work together to help protect that endpoint. Uh, barring any of that not catching it, you also have the ability to send things to a, a sandbox, right? So that's that's always great as well, Cloud Sandbox. Also having the endpoint sensors enabled on there for uh, activity detections that you can feed off to an XDR platform, which brings to this, the next bullet, deploying network-based IDS, intrusion detection system, uh, if not an IPS for protection, intrusion pr protection system. Um, that feeds into an XDR platform like Deep Discovery Director. Uh, Deep Discovery Director is uh, the platform that is hosted in cloud. Uh, Vision One uses that to communicate with Deep Discovery Inspector on premise. And that allows you to uh, identify what's happening on the network, replay what's happening and see all that communication that you would lose with a traditional EDR, which just has sensors on endpoints. And then lastly, uh, deploy an XDR platform uh, like Trend Microvision One, so you can pull all that together, have it in one place. You can see um, the broad spectrum of what's happening within your environment, identify the risk, identify the events, and mitigate those quickly. Okay, I've seen a couple questions come in. Um, was there anything uh, that came in that we that you can answer, Chris? Uh, one was just someone pointing out um, to identify identify the patch as soon as possible, change related passwords right after patching. And if you think you're not affected, that's that's a really, really good practice, uh, especially when, you've, when you're dealing with the situation with the Fortinet one, right? Um, the patch was already available after the public disclosure of it. And you're not quite sure whether or not you're affected, right? I mean, they could have been harvesting uh, passwords. What, what we saw in this leak situation where it was 500,000 IPs. Um, so yeah, just taking that, that extra step of going, you know what, I was, I was vulnerable to this. I don't know whether or not I was affected by it, but just because I know what information they're stealing from me, I'm going to go ahead and take the extra step and reset my user accounts. Right. Um, yeah. That, well, and, and that's a really good observation. Let's take that one step further. So yeah. I, I'll make, um, go back to the um, timeline. So in the timeline, the vulnerability was discovered by someone, right? Mm -hmm. um, they responsibly disclosed it to uh, to Fortinet so that they could go in and patch this, this vulnerability, right? So from the time it was discovered to the time there was a patch, 
was about 10 months, right? So th that's a long time to be vulnerable. But the idea behind responsible disclosure was something that um, Trend Micro Zero Trust Initiative does is it allows that vendor to patch before it's publicly disclosed to everybody and everybody knows that you're susceptible, right? So you give the vendor time to patch. Once it's patched, then you make it publicly available, that information so that your customers know, hey, you need to update this in case they're not paying attention to newsletters or something that's coming out um, from, from your vendor. So yep. um, can you talk a little bit more about like what is the typical turnaround time from um, disclosure to patching and that sort of thing and how, and, my, how customers are susceptible at that time? So it depends, right, on the vulnerability. Some vulnerabilities will get patched faster than others, depending on how complicated and how ingrained the, uh, the, the vulnerability is, right? I mean, we just went through the Microsoft summer of uh, print spooler problems, right? And man, I swear, every time that they said that they had a patch for print spooler, there was a new vulnerability for it because no one had looked at print spooler service for 20 years, right? And now you got researchers and attackers looking at print spooler and they're finding all these other holes that just happen to exist this entire time. Um, so yeah, it, it just kind of depends. Um, I've seen it where disclosure has come out and the patch was out immediately because maybe the company themselves before it was uh, even found was aware of it, right? From their own internal testing. Um, I've seen it also where like we, we Trend Micro, we got zero day, right? Where I think it's a 30 or 60 day disclo public disclosure agreement. If, uh, if the vendor agrees to do the patching. Um, but once we find it, we'll actually put an IPS rule associated with it before the vulnerability the vulnerability is publicly released and patched with the vendor, right? If we can figure out how to stop it from a network layer perspective. Um, and then, uh, yeah. So in this case here, you had 10 months, right? So go back to your, go up one more slide and let's talk about the attack itself, right? So you got your threat actor, right? Go ahead. One more. There you go. Your threat actor is authenticated in your environment. That's, that's problem number one, right? So you got 10 months of this open vulnerability It's probably, it's likely being exploited um, actively. We'll give it maybe too much, right? Because typically threat actors will kind of pick up on things sometimes a little earlier than a patch will get out. So let's click through here till we get to the solutions. And then I can just kind of walk through the individual pieces. And I really like the idea of the geo blocking. So geo blocking is really good for like first defense efforts, but understand that if I can scan your environment and see that a vulnerability exists, I will just, I will, I'll just go around. I'll use a VPN. Can, can you expand uh, on that through uh, the Shodan tool that, that's publicly available? <laughs> the, the search engine of vulnerabilities <laughs> out there, uh, Shodan.io. I mean, uh, you can use that tool. There's other ones out there as well. I'm sure the Darknet themselves, threat actors have their own tool sets as well. Basically, you can drop in uh, known CVEs, right? And essentially find machines that are uh, impacted by it. Um, you know, earlier this morning, me and you, Tim, we were running through an exercise and we did an exchange one, right? And I mean, what, we discovered 16,000 devices just sitting out there. With a um, CVE that was years old. Uh, no, this one was, uh, two months old. Remember? Well, it was, was a, a okay. yeah, it was a 2021 one that we were looking at. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, still 16,000 exchange servers still sitting out there and, why are people not in patching is probably because it's not being disclosed properly by the vendor. And, the, the, you know, I'm not going to get into that. That's a, that's a rabbit hole. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, geo blocking works for a first defense, right? If you're not going to communicate with a country, then why allow traffic to begin with? Right. So you can shut it off. Just understand that geo blocking is not perfect. I can easily mask my IP and come through through VPN. Um, in this attack here, so 
you know, you have your everyday user, they authenticate, and then they, uh, they end up in your firewall, right? They end up on your endpoint or your server, whatever the, uh, the account access has. I mean, we, I, I looked through a lot of the uh, leaked passwords. There's a lot of admin accounts in there. So um, just as an example, so like if they can already get to the admin credentials part, now the threat actor is going to want to enumerate your domain, right? And how do you find that? Well, the DDI would pick up on it, right? That, hey, said payload is being downloaded from VPN website, right? It's coming in through a VPN website. I, I mean, VPNs are found every day. Um, but this payload was sandboxed. By the way, this payload does this. It's a backdoor or it's uh, another credential stealer or it's a, um, a ransomware file, for instance, right? The DDI saw that. The threat actor had no idea that it existed because the DDI is out of the loop on the network, right? So even though the, your threat actor scanned the network and tried to enumerate what's there, the DDI is able to pick up on that information and feed it back into vision one, right? And hence the difference between endpoint sensor versus XDR. Um, the XDR piece is, is the key, it's the new defense really. Um, if you ask anybody on my team, what's one of the first options that we put in? We put in XDR sensors to begin with, with the endpoint, right? Of course, that, that's the easiest one. We have the agent already. It's a single agent. We just deploy the policy. But the DDI is the next part. And the reason why is because that DDI can see a lot more than those endpoints can. The other part, too, is that you're trusting. If you're just doing endpoint sensor, you're trusting that uh, your entire environment is covered with the proper agent and the proper services, and they're all running at optimal levels all the time, right? I don't know about every other IT admin that's probably on this webinar, but I know how that works in the real world. <laughs> Let's face it, we have a 10% failure sometimes, 5% failure, and that's the other part where that DDI comes in at. Um, and then being able to put it all together, right? It's a lot of data. How, how do I know that, okay, this action took place, but then I also saw actions on the endpoint do this, this, and this. And being able to correlate those and stick them into a single console is the win, uh, winning action when it comes to response. I can tell you we've, um, we did two IR cases this last, not this week, last week, right? Um, two customers. One customer didn't have a uh, vision one available in sense, like it wasn't already deployed. The other customer did. So we got customer A and customer B. Customer A, it took us two days to figure out all the backdoors associated with the attack. They didn't get ransomware. We, we were able to jump in before that, but trying to piece together all of the different backdoors that they used. By the time we deployed Vision One, we discovered that they were on 100 plus devices already, automated deployments, right? And they were actively spreading across the network. Customer B had Vision One. We responded, same deal. We look into Vision One and within 20 to 30 minutes, we're confident in what we're looking at in the sense that we know what IP addresses need to be addressed. We know about what region and we kind of got what information they were touching, right? Think about that. Two days versus 20 to 30 minutes, right? That, that's a major difference. Um, and then you throw the DDI piece in. And we threw the DDI piece in on both of them. And we found a lot more <laughs> activity going on because threat actors, their jobs or to try to get around detections 100% of the time. That's all they want to do. And then they come in and just try to make a big bank. Uh, I call it buying Ferraris. Um, that's what, that's what I, I hope that that's what they're doing with all the ransomware money that they get. <laughs> yeah, a good but, question came in, uh, Chris, from Theodore. How fast can you shut off traffic 
from an endpoint? And if, if so, is communication still available from vision one to the agent? Yes. Great, great question. So if you see something on an endpoint, you can actually right click as a response action in vision one and hit isolate. And then if you wanted to continue to do investigations on that endpoint, you can actually start a remote shell from vision one and run your own custom investigation scripts as well, whether they're PowerShell or bash files, um, you can build them and deploy them accordingly from vision one and have that information get fed back to you. You can even, um, from the remote shell, you can even collect files. You can zip them up, password protect them. If you know you think that it's malicious payload, you can uh, use the command line to zip them up with a password and then move them accordingly through your network. Yeah, and it, it's very fast. So you identify it, yeah. you right click on it, you go to isolate, it's gonna isolate right away. Uh, and then yep. you can get to doing your triage, right? Doing your 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 pools of data, as Chris was saying. And basically what it does is right, it, build, it builds up a wall around that endpoint or multiple endpoints, whatever you choose to, uh, to isolate and uh, removes all communication except from the Vision One console and its uh, management server, server, its management yep. server. Yeah. Excellent. <clears throat> so- Any some, other some, questions? There was one other question that came in about the operating system. Let me see if I can find it. Jessica asked, does the OS version matter? I asked because I was working at a place that was hit when the attack hit and we couldn't patch all versions of Windows, i.e. Windows 7 Service Pack 3. So I'm assuming the, this Fortinet attack was coming through to them and they yeah. got hit, but they couldn't patch their Windows 7 Service yeah. Pack 3. Windows 7 is unfortunately the new Windows XP, right? It's uh, it's <laughs> end of life, it's, end of support. It's end of life, end of support kind of deal. Um, I would say that I would look into Apex One specifically for it, or you can actually. I'm about to blow everybody's heads up right here. You could actually run Cloud One workload security on uh on Windows 7 if uh if the day comes that Apex One no longer supports it, uh, the kernel is supported in Cloud One as well. Um, and you could use the IPS modules in that. Just saying though, ideally you should be moving, you should be trying to devise a plan to get away from it and start moving towards Windows 10. Right, because right? the, the IPS, the virtual patching will buy you some time so you can get it's the patch rolled out but it's not meant to be there forever, right? Like you, you, you need to have the responsibility of your endpoints in your environment to make sure they're up to date. Yeah, because sure. think of it, if uh, we'll take a Windows 2003 server, for instance, right? There's so an unpatched one for, we'll even go to an unpatched one, right? It's just a Windows 2003 box out there. There's so many vulnerabilities out there for it that if you try to do the IPS on it, with the agent, the amount of work that you're causing that agent to do on your network drivers of the uh, endpoint or the server in this case, is just too overloading. And then you'll just end up with massive performance problems, right? Yeah. Um, and nobody wants that. We want the agents to run as clean as possible, but keep you secure as well, right? Like that's the happy balance. And to answer your question, Theodore, yes, uh, Cloud One workload security is deep security as a service. Um, we rolled uh, deep security as a service into the Cloud One platform and renamed it to Cloud One workload security. So it is the same thing. Um, but as with, with most SaaS first companies, all the updates and protections um, that get updated engines, et cetera, are going to go to SaaS before they go to on prem. So just keep that yep. in mind. The other thing, too, about Cloud One workload is activity monitoring. That's yeah, not has, available in deep security. Right. So it has the built-in uh, sensor to feed to uh, Vision One, but uh, deep security on-prem, you can deploy a uh, standalone sensor from Vision One to get that data up. So that's the Delta, right? You yep. would have to deploy a separate sensor. Yep. Um, how will having, you know, DDI and XDR, Vision One, and all this together, how will this make uh, an organization's uh, SOC or security team more efficient, better at their so, jobs, if you will. So I would say 
it, it can make your job easier, but you have to also have the right skill sets in place, right? It's not necessarily like I can throw all the technology to you in the world, but if you don't have the, and it's nothing against anybody out there, right? Cybersecurity is not easy. Um, I mean, I, I live and breathe it. And I'm going to tell you my, my head hurts. Sometimes I, I leave work sometimes and I'm like, I just don't even want to see a computer. Um, <laughs> don't even talk to me about computers. Um, but if you don't, even with all the technology out there, don't get me wrong, automation analysis, it, it works great, right? And it, it gets you kind of started. Uh, but it comes down also with the personnel looking at it, right? You have to understand that, hey, I saw this detection. This detection, the agent picked up on it. I saw it do this on the network, right? But then all of a sudden, I don't see anything else around it. But I know that that detection itself, that particular attack, could mean that they could possibly pivot and change their attack, right? Like it's a post-exploit attack, not a initial exploit. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Where we're looking at, I'm already at stage two, stage three, right? So I need... I get it. The agent stopped it or they took a block action or alerted me on something, but is there anything else there, right? Should I go and investigate it further? And that's kind of where the uh, skill set part comes in. You can have all the technology in the world. You can have all the tools in the world, but if you can't recognize when you have a specific attack taking place, that you need to take the next step of initiating the investigation, um, it, it none of it's going to help you, right? It, it's you're just uh, you're just as blind as before. And then that's where um, XCR really shines, right? Because it brings all that stuff together. So it, it's it's above uh, it's an augmentation to a sim, right? So you're getting all the data to the sim, but you need to identify where those needles are in that haystack of data. Uh, versus an XDR, which will kind of present that to you, right? Yep. Yeah. So what's cool about the XDR piece, and it's not to bash on other people, it's that the information that it does relay to you is in a plain English method, right? Where it's possible, you know, early indicator of X ransomware, right? Uh, possible credential dropping here, right? Like those are easy pieces to pick up on quickly to say, hey, uh, why is PowerShell dumping the LSAS process, right? Like, why, why is that happening right now? Um, I don't have an application on that server that does that, right? Or what application is doing that? I need to bring that up to that vendor, right? And be like, hey, you need to explain to me why you're doing this because you're stealing all my credentials when you do this, right? Um, Actions like that, right? And it, it's in plain English for you right in your face. The other cool thing too, like me and you were going through this this after, uh, this morning and I, I, I didn't even know that that existed was, um, you know, the GUI interface of being able to walk through your processes, right? Your process chain and um, being able to clean it up as you go, right? Like, so we did one parent process and we looked at it and we're like, ah, that's not really what we're looking at. And we just clicked it off and it was gone out of vision, right? So that noise is out of the way. I don't have to worry about it because it's not part of the chain. It's just happened to be running at that time. So um, it, that, that I, I liked a lot. I'm glad you showed me that trick today. <laughs> Uh, versus the what I've been doing with. Um, and by the way, that's the other benefit of SaaS products is there's updates that are constantly happening. So improvement wise is happening on a, it, I get the meet, I get the emails every day, but there's, there's improvements happening on a daily, it seems. I had a conversation back with a CISO on uh, Vision One and they were using our email protection cloud app security for Office 365. Mm -hmm. um, and he didn't realize, and it's been in there for quite a while, that some of the response actions you can do within the product. So you, you know, a workbench is automatically created because it's identified uh, event markers that look suspicious or malicious, right? And you can right click on that email uh, as it came in 
and you can quarantine the message or delete the message straight from Office 365 account without having to go into any other products. So that kind of expands the capabilities from built in, right? You've got the ability yep. to do remote shell and remote scripting and the um, file pools. And the, there's so much that you can do um, from within the, the console that's just a time saver, right? When, when it comes to identifying an event and mitigating it as quick as possible, not having to jump around really saves a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, and I think and that was, what, yeah, go ahead. The other thing too, is that you can also grab like IOCs from third-party locations, right? That's what's cool about Vision One today is that you can import that information into the Vision One console and use it for sweepings. Um, because let's face it, we're one we're one vendor, right? But there's other threat researchers out there, right? That that have public repositories, and you can grab that data and bring it into your Vision One. You know, that, that's uh, really exciting coming, you know. Yeah, the third-party uh, threat intel that automatically come in and sweep your environment and block things as they come in. There's, there's a question, there's two questions that came in while we were talking. Um, one yep. from Brandon Carr, which is kind of, I'm going to put it in here in front of Theodore. I, I'll come back to you. Don't worry about that. Um, so often we block full IPs and do it in at domain dot com block as well on the firewall and of course do geo blocking but spam phishing traffic from those ips will still get through what is the next level block to fully block those ips and so i think you need to get closer to to the endpoint at that point right so email we, you've got web reputation uh there you can block you can block on ips and dot coms there you can block on the endpoint that has web reputation from the protection agent but you can also feed that into vision one's suspicious objects and have products blocked on that and identified based on that. So there's multiple different levels as you move away from just relying on the firewall to do it, uh, moving back into your environment as well. Uh, I don't know, Chris, if you have any other thoughts on that one. Yeah, because the suspicious objects, I'm glad you touched on that one. That one's very important. Uh, we use it all the time for any kind of hashing or items that we find in our uh, investigations, right? You drop them into suspicious objects, whatever products you have tied into vision one, it gets deployed out and applied whatever the rule is, whether you're logging it or blocking or quarantining, right? Um, so Brandon, yeah, to answer that question, that, that would be your solution for that because it takes it outside of the firewall and it's another plus on why SaaS is better than on-prem solutions. Because say, um, say you got cloud app security, for instance, okay, and it's tied to 0365, you give it the suspicious object, it's going to go ahead and take the block action associated with that domain, right? It's not getting in through the email there. Uh, but say you're not using 0365 and you're using an on-prem exchange server, that's fine, um, or a hosted exchange server somewhere else, right? Your endpoint could get that same notification to say that that at domain.com functionality right uh needs to be blocked so you could use it to uh to take action before it gets to your end user yeah and you got a lot of people working from home these days because of covid there's some organizations that aren't even returning to work or doing hybrid so if they're not connected to the vpn 24 7 they're not necessarily going to be protected from that plus you've got split tunnel vpn so a lot of that isn't protected anyway so how do you protect those endpoints you got to get closer to those endpoints uh, yep. You can't keep them all within the castle or with the moat surrounding it. <laughs> yeah. Um, Theater had two questions here, so I'm going to go to him. Uh, on the uh, can one schedule or find out how often vulnerability scanning and virtual patching happens. So in cloud on workload security, yes, you can schedule. Uh, same with deep security. You can schedule scanning and you can auto apply virtual patches. So as new vulnerabilities are identified in your operating systems, Linux, Windows, um, it will automatically apply that virtual patch and then it'll recognize again when it does its scan again of the environment, which is done um, by default on a regular basis, nightly. Um, it will remove those virtual patches as you patch physically. Okay, so you don't have to worry about that. Uh, and the other question was, can one leverage Vision One to watch for data loss prevention? And if so, help one improve on DLP roles such as social security numbers? So at this time, uh, we don't have the ability to watch over DLP. Uh, that's something I can definitely bring back to the team. Uh, I'm product operations manager over XDR and our, our Vision One product line. 
Uh, right now that resides inside the Apex One product line. Um, and we also have some network devices uh, like um, web reputation and uh, the IWS VA and that sort of thing um, that will do that. But uh, it's certainly something I can read back. Also, it's in the email, uh, cloud app security protection as well. Um, but yeah, that's that's a good good thought on that. I'll bring that back. And then uh, I see Monica asked a question too. Did I miss one? Uh, but, yeah, in the uh, Q&A form. So oh. in that one, she asked, uh, and I like this question because we get asked a lot about this. Uh, we have one firewall within a data center, but three other physical buildings within our network in the US. We would require a DDI in each physical location. So that one, it kind of depends on how your network is lined up and architect and what exactly um, you want to be able to view, right? So you have one firewall within the data center. Oh, shoot, hold on. Let me swap over here. <laughs> uh, you have one firewall within the data center. So I will tell you that the DDI attached directly to your firewall, you're going to see a lot of traffic if uh, the firewall is not doing IPS or anything like that, especially if you put it in front of it, you're going to see a lot of alerts coming from there. Um, but if you know that you have a core switch, right, that feeds into that data center, and you know that I got port one, two, and three, for example, on that core switch, these ports are coming from building one, two, and three as well. I can take port four, span off these three ports and feed it into the DDI, or if I need to, because of the way the DDI is built, you can actually span port one to port four, port two to five, three to six, if that makes sense, right? And span that traffic over, that way you get the mirrored copy off of it and allow your DDI to uh, monitor it accordingly. So there's multiple NICs on the DDI, and they can they sit on the outside of the network flow traffic, right? So that's that's how they will work. And uh, you could potentially, if you have uh, a big enough DDI design, or if your bandwidth is not too heavy, you could do it with just one. Clear as mud. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I followed you pretty good there. <laughs> So uh, any, any last thoughts or any last questions from anybody? We try to keep these uh, sessions uh, pretty short and uh, to the point. So we, cause we know everybody's got time and a lot of you are probably doing this over your lunch break. So we appreciate your attendance. Um, okay. Yeah, thank you, go ahead. Oh no, I was just gonna say to uh, wrap oh. things up here a little bit. So um, yeah, unless there is another question, I didn't see any in yeah, the we, uh, chat so we have one more worry i think okay. tim you could talk about this more than i can worry free business versus vision one so i so worry free business is great for um small to medium business right it it gives you the tools that you need it will give you some uh information telemetry wise where it starts to break down a little bit is when you try to do the integrations with other products and get the full XDR component of it. So within Worry Free, you've got a Vision One console. It's pretty um, stripped down though. Uh, you don't you won't have the ability to add the network component or the email component. Um, so in that case, we would recommend that you you move up to, from Worry Free to Apex One so that you can really get that information uh, and and do that correlation. So one of the one of the things we didn't really touch on a lot. XDR is great for putting all the events in one place for you to find them. Um, but for an event, we have an incident view that will show you everything that's happened. So if an email came in and that was one workbench and uh, we saw ransomware on an endpoint and, and network um, lateral movement on another, and those could be three separate workbenches, we'll tie those all together as an incident for you. So you, can, you know exactly where to go and start your investigation and then you can pivot as you need to as you're going through. Um, Worry-free is not going to be able to give you that depth, right? Because it's, it's more concentrating on small and medium business. Um, but definitely, if that's something you're interested in, Dave, uh, we can certainly get you something set up and you, you get, a, get a test drive of both of those products uh, and multiples, right, working together. So um, my, my preference would be to move towards the Apex and Vision 1 side for that full visibility. All right. 
thanks, Tim. Any other questions? So um, if, if not, uh, did want to thank everybody for joining us today. Um, also remind everybody, we do have a dedicated uh, landing page. Um, it's our uh, breach detection uh, resource hub. So there's a, a, a QR code you can scan, um, or you can go to trendmicro.com slash breach detection. Uh, it's where you can find out about this uh, webinar series, um, you know, information for ones that are coming up. Also, uh, you know, different research articles. Um, if you're interested in test driving Vision One, your know, information's there. Um, also, feel free uh, if you have any questions, you know, for, for Chris, Tim, um, or myself, our emails uh, are on the screen here. And uh, also, just real quickly, wanted to make everyone aware <laughs> we do have an upcoming uh, threat webinar um, on the 30th here. So it's just the, uh, you know, here shortly. It's going to be kind of a mid year. Uh, security report of different things we're uh, seeing out there. And that's going to be uh, led by our uh, director of global threat communications, uh, John Clay. And if you're interested in attending that, um, there's a QR code here uh, along with the link as well, where you can register for that. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us and, um, you know, feel free to uh, reach out to us if, if there's anything, uh, you know, if you think of anything uh, else that you forgot to ask or you know, we're afraid to ask or anything like that. So appreciate everybody's time. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody. Thank you.